In this second installment of a two-part episode, we look at the costumes of Claire Randall Fraser from the Star series Outlander, coming up. Welcome back to another episode of Costume Co. If this is your first time to the channel, we do almost weekly videos on the costumes from some of your favorite shows and movies. If this is something that interests you, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss out. In this episode, we pick up with Claire's costumes from Season 1 of Outlander. And I have so many people helping with this video, I can't wait to share it all with you. Dress historian and material culturist Brenna Barks is back once again to help out with this video. If you've caught any of the previous installments of this Outlander series, you might recall how much Brenna has brought to these videos with her extensive knowledge of Scottish historical costume. And I've also added Brenna's links in the description below, along with a link to my complete interview with her that I've put on my Facebook page. Sandy Russo from Knitsy Blonde has also returned to answer many of my questions about the knits from the Outlander series. So not only does Sandy have an extensive knowledge of the knits from the show, but she also recreates many of them from the show and sells them through her Etsy page. Warning, there will be spoilers for the entire first season and some from season two of the Stars series Outlander. Please refrain from leaving spoilery material on future seasons in the comment section. Thank you. Before I get to Claire's costume, I have three viewer submissions that I want to share with you in one of my favorite segments where I feature your cosplay, artwork, and costume designs from your favorite shows. First up, I got this amazing illustration from Courtney Yu of Claire's yellow Parisian cloak from season two. Courtney studies costume construction techniques so that she can replicate the costumes in her illustrations. This is just one of her many pieces, but she thought my viewers might enjoy this piece since we are on sort of, you know, an outlander kick. And for any other illustrators out there, Courtney also offers a course called No Nudes, Just Clothes, The Basics of Drawing Historical Costume on iPad, and that's through Skillshare. I'll leave a link to her that along with Courtney's social media if you want to check out all of her work. Next up is this stunning dress cosplay by Dystopia. It's Claire's season 2 costume from the episode Not in Scotland Anymore. She tells me that she drafted the pattern herself and made it with 5 yards of black silk and 2.5 and of silk batiste for the sleeves. It's worn over period correct undergarments. The jewelry is a reproduction Victorian chatelaine and the rope chain is stainless steel that has been painted and sealed to make it look like tarnished silver. Finally, here is Tatiana Melendez's costume design of Leary's Season 1 trial dress. Tatiana sent this to me shortly after I aired my analysis video of Leary's costume and hair and this is what she came up with as an alternative which I just love. She also provided me with an extensive explanation so I'll leave a link of that down below. I have a few more cosplays I'm going to sprinkle throughout this video so for now I'd like to thank Courtney, Dystopia and Tatiana for submitting their works of art. And you can also submit your artwork or cosplay to me, and it doesn't have to be Outlander. I'll leave my contact info in the description below. One of Claire's most highly coveted dresses is this tartan gown with a contrasting embroidered silk under petticoat and stomacher from the fourth episode called The Gathering. Costume designer Terry Dresback explains on her blog that the wardrobe crew were under the gun to get the dress done on time and that it was further complicated by actor Katrina Balfe's shooting schedule. And as a former wardrobe head, I can tell you that one of the most challenging aspects of costuming is getting the actor in for fittings. Dresback explains it this way. When you make a dress, first you make a toile, a dress out of muslin. That is to fit on the actor and work out any kinks, make any changes. It's a rough draft. Then you make it out of the actual fabric and you need two fittings, one to make sure it is all going well now that you are in fabric, and then a final fit just to double check everything. 
and then you need the time in between fittings to do the actual work. So it takes two to three weeks with the fittings interspersed. Here is costume designer Terry Dresbach's November 2013 sketch of Claire's gathering costume with swatches. Her notes read, plaid tartan gown, embroidered stomacher and skirt, organza trim. Dresbeck also describes the mad scramble to get the fabric in time. You pick 10 fabrics, call the mill, and see what they have in stock. That takes a while because they aren't on film business schedules. And the embroidered fabric, I had bought a meter of embroidered silk in London. I liked it but wasn't totally sure about it, and I didn't know what tartan I would end up with. But when the tartan finally came in, it was a pretty good match with the embroidery. But when we called the fabric store, they were all out. Now, in the end, the London shop was able to locate more of the embroidered silk fabric in India. Dresback said that there was a ton of focus on the dress because it was the first time everyone was dressed up. Television shows love a party or a wedding, so there was a wee bit of pressure. From the final costume, I believe that Dresback went with a metallic gold chantilly lace for the trim and inner sleeve ruffles. And in this image, you can see that the scalloped edge of the silk is pinked with shears. Here's a studio shot of the gown. Dresbeck said of the final look, I love the combination of plaid and flowered embroidery. You can find that kind of mix often in the 18th century peasant costumes, but I took the leap that they might have had that in Scotland. I think it works. I like the dress, but it was definitely a product of circumstance, made by master craftsmen, but hampered by the growing pains of the show. Here is Natasha Bieberfeld of Socialist Revolution, dressed in a reproduction of Claire's gathering costume with her Jamie. Natasha tells me, I made it about five months after season one aired. At that point, there wasn't really anyone costuming from the show because there weren't fabric matches identified yet. I spent a lot of time researching and was able to source the fabrics from the UK. And despite Terry Dresbeck snatching up the last of the fabric, Natasha said, A friend works at a shop in London that supplied some things for the show, and he sold me the last two meters in existence of that accurate embroidered silk. Natasha didn't tell me how much it cost, but according to Terry Dresbeck, she said that it was crazy expensive. Sadly, Natasha tells me that the embroidered fabric is no longer available. But I did find a few embroidered fabrics that I thought might work. So for instance, this pink floral faux silk embroidery fabric is from Etsy. And since it's faux silk, it's priced very reasonably. And if you want to go a little bit higher in, here is a gorgeous cream textured raw silk with floral embroidery from Top Fabric of Soho in London. Real Chantilly lace is ridiculously expensive, so here is an eyelash trim from Etsy that's much more reasonable. And finally, La Karen of Scotland tells me that Terry Drasbeck purchased this Ross hunting weathered tartan fabric from them. And like in this sample scene on the right, the cloth weight for dressmaking is usually the Reaver 10 ounce weight or lightweight tartan. And you can also order samples of the tartan before starting your project. So I'll leave links to all of these suppliers in the comment section below. According to Dresbeck, Claire's tweed slightly asymmetrical riding coat that she wears in episode 4 and 5 was born out of necessity. We didn't plan on it, she said, but it was so bitterly cold. And Kate Bath had been through so much wearing that shift, I just couldn't send her back out into the freezing winter without something very seriously warm. So Mrs. Fitz went back into her trunks and dug up this coat. It is very, very warm, and our girl was very, very warm. It's sort of an inside joke, but Dresbeck often calls on Mrs. Fitzgibbons, who is the head housekeeper at Castle Leoc, to dress Claire from her many trunks of clothes. The tweed coat has a generously deep hood that's trimmed with fur. As you can see here, the coat is cut similar to a caraco, which is essentially a hip-length coat. And like Claire's bodices, the coat has inverted box pleats that give the skirt its fullness. Here are a few examples of 18th century riding jackets that Dresbach says inspired the silhouette of Claire's coat. 
The 1740s coat on the left is made from worsted wool and it's trimmed with brocaded silk and silk satin. According to the John Bright collection that owns this coat, it states that this lady's riding jacket is based on the cut of men's coats of the time. The fullness of of its skirt and its hard-wearing fabric make it a very practical garment which, together with a matching petticoat or skirt, could also be worn for traveling. And the 18th century wool and silk coat on the right is cut in much the same way. This French riding coat is from the Met. This worsted wool British riding coat dates between 1750 and 59, and it's from the V&A. The coat is lined with linen and silk, and the first two coats are meant to be worn open with a waistcoat, while this jacket, like Claire's, is fastened at the front with buttons. The collar and cuffs appear to be trimmed with rabbit or fox fur, although I'm not certain if it's real or faux fur, and the coat itself appears to be a Harris tweed. And as we've mentioned in previous videos, when Brenna has explained that the fabrics are too heavy for the time, Harris tweed wasn't really a thing until the 19th century. The historical examples of the riding coats depicted that I showed you in the previous slides show a much finer worsted type wool. Brenna Barks says, Tweed, I cannot find any evidence before the 19th century, but it's not an area I'm as familiar with as I would like to be. However, a quick search through both the National Museum of Scotland and Victoria Albert Museum collections show nothing before the late 19th century. If you want to recreate Claire's tweed jacket, here's a genuine Harris tweed that I think is a pretty good match that's from Tartan Time in Edinburgh, Scotland. This barleycorn tweed has a prominent flecked pattern that is more richly textured than your standard plain twill weave. The high-end faux fur fabric on the right is also a pretty good likeness to Claire's fur trim. This faux fur and reindeer from Fabric Online in the UK, and according to their website, is a multi-tonal, long-haired faux fur with a white base and beige and gray tones. So I'll leave a link for both those fabrics in the description below. And Dresbeck stated on her blog that she's not sure, but she thinks she might have purchased the buttons from Britex Fabric in San Francisco. It doesn't appear that they have the same domed buttons used on the coat, but I thought that these thistle antique gold blazer buttons might be a great option. Dresbeck said, the gloves are made with kid and we printed and drew stag antlers on them in honor of the Mackenzies. Here's an example of gloves from the period that are on display at the Met. These British leather and metallic gloves are from the early 18th century. These reproduction kid leather gloves from the Outlander store are actually pretty decent quality, but the reproduction coats I've seen don't look that great. So it might be partly that the models don't wear the riding jacket over period correct underpinning, so the silhouette is off. So if you've ordered a ready-made Claire riding jacket, let me know in the comments section if it met your expectations or not. Here is Claire's full-length hooded cloak from the episode Both Sides Now. The wool cloak is lined in tartan fabric and fastened at the neck with a giant hook. From an historical perspective, Brenna states, Largely what we see in the mid-18th century is the Arisade, and that was among the poor and working classes. Cloaks would have been made of the usual fabrics, usually wool. Brenna says that while women did wear cloaks in the 18th century, it's hard to find surviving examples since outerwear would suffer more wear and tear than the garments that are usually preserved. She shows me this rare example of a mid to late 18th century cloak from the Colonial Williamsburg Museum. This red wool broadcloth cloak is English and it's lined in dull red silk. Here's another example of a wool cloak dating from the last third of the 18th century. According to the mat where the cloak is displayed, this particular type of cloak, called a cardinal because of its color, is made of a closely woven wool cut on the bias and left with a raw edge along the hem. Brenna Bark says in her Frockflix article, there's also the fact that tartan, essentially an expensive fabric, is used to line Claire's cloak. You don't hide fabrics that expensive, at least not in the Highland culture, which was rather flamboyant. And according to Gordon Kirkbright, the designer of the Outlander tartan, the lining is Douglas Weathered Tartan. The cloak is cut in a circle, but there are darts at the shoulders for a bit of shaping. 
And if you look closely, you will see that the hem of the cloak is distressed. Like Claire's riding coat, the two-piece hood is cut very generously. Here are two fabrics that I think might work for the cloak. On the left is Camel Wool Melton Coating from Cali Fabric, and on the right is Douglas Weathered Lightweight Tartan Fabric from La Caron of Scotland. So I'll leave those links in the description below. Here is a reproduction of Claire's cloak by Ayana Costumes and Crafts, and she's pictured with her Jamie. She tells me, it took me some time to figure out which tartan it was. For once, I spent hours and hours on Scottish Registered Tartan Database, then ordered different swatches from different websites. And the final fabric came from Scotland, she thinks, maybe from Scotland Shop. Ayana Costume says, the construction in itself was pretty simple. The tricky part was to figure out where the sewing line would be, as I could not make it in one single part, as the cloak is a huge circle, about five meters of tartan for the lining, and the same amount for the actual wool fabric. Here's a studio shot of her cloak in comparison to Claire's cloak from the series. When I asked her where she purchased the clasps, she tells me, I did search for the perfect ones for months, but could not find the screen accurate ones, unfortunately. I found some pretty similar one on Etsy, though. Claire wears this lovely green tartan dress in episode 5. The dress features a bodice with three-quarter length slightly bell-shaped sleeves with a simple linen ruffle insert and a fully pleated skirt. She wears the dress again in episode 6. Here's a good close-up of the bodice. The stomacher portion is cut on the bias and it appears boned at the center front and the neckline is trimmed in matching braid. Claire wears the dress once again in episode seven. Here's a great side view. The shelf is created by the bum roll under the dress. In this picture, you can see the skirt pockets. Here's the dress from an Outlander exhibit. Here is Natasha Beaverfeld of Socialist Revolution once again modeling this Claire green tartan dress cosplay. Natasha tells me that the green dress was made with American Duchess's simplicity pattern with her recommended hacks. This inspired tartan called Lost Soul was created by Gordon Kirkbright, the original designer of the Outlander tartan fabric. Natasha purchased the fabric from Gordon Kirkbright and Jennifer Begley through GK Textiles. So I'll leave Natasha's social media links so that you can check out all of her cosplay creations along with the links to the simplicity pattern and tartan fabric in the comment section below. I thought that I'd also show you this incredible pleated skirt from Ayana Costumes and Crafts. I'm always so mesmerized by beautifully pressed pleats. Ayana Costume tells me that she didn't get to finish the bodice before leaving for France, lucky girl, but hopes to get back to it when she returns. So for the skirt alone, she used 8 meters of the same Lost Soul tartan fabric from GK Textiles, which she says is lovely to work with. So hopefully we can get a picture of her wearing it when all is said and done. Here's a work in progress of the skirt by Ayana Costumes and Crafts, attaching the waistband to the pleated skirt. Claire adds this lovely knit shawl in episode 5. According to Nitsy Blonde, the rent shawl, as it's called because of the name of the episode, is a garter stitch, triangle-shaped shawl that uses a technique called intarsia for doing the different colored stripes. Here is what Sandy's version of the rent shawl looks like from the front and back. The entire shawl is knit in one piece. Sandy makes the shawl in four different color combinations. The green's black tweed is like Claire's shawl. Here is what the heathered tweed wool looks like, Sandy's saying. They have what is called neeps embedded in the yarn. Those are little flecks that you see. This is worsted weight wool and size eight or nine needles, not the big chunky stuff like the cowl. You can purchase Sandy's shawls from her Etsy shop. The rent one is one of her most popular items. All of her knits are made to order and depending on the time of year and size of the item, it takes about six to eight weeks to make. Or if you're a savvy knitter, you can also order her pattern from her shop as well. She also has a great video tutorial on intarsia knitting that I'll leave below with her other links. In episode seven, Claire wears this stunning wedding gown and her marriage to Jamie. When I press Brenna Barks to tell me which Claire costume is her favorite from season one, she says, 
if I have to pick absolutely one, it's her wedding dress. I know exactly what gown was referenced, and I think they did such a beautiful job of recreating it to fit a modern silhouette. This is Dresback's sketch of Claire's wedding gown from 2014. So it's possible that this was drawn after the fact, as sketches sometimes are done once the initial concepts are finalized. So her notes read, silver linen gown, sheer silk smocked sleeves, silk stomacher and underskirt, metal embroidery, acorn branches, falling leaves. In one of the very rare occurrences in cable television, the production of Outlander managed to get some excellent shots of Claire in really good light. They even went so far as to do a reveal of the gown and a full head-to-toe shot so that we could see all the detail on the bodice and embroidery that carries down into the underskirt. Liz Bolton, costume maker and embroiderer for three seasons of Outlander, tells me that this technique is called silver plate embroidery. Here, of course, is an excellent head-to-toe studio shot of actors Katrina Belf and Sam Hewen in their wedding finery. Brenna tells me that Claire's 18th century wedding gown was inspired by this extraordinary Sophia Magdalena, Queen of Sweden wedding gown from 1766. This style of wedding gown is a so-called robe de coeur, meaning court dress, and it's sewn according to current French fashion of the time. The origin of the costume has long been unknown, but it's thought that the costume was sewn in Copenhagen with fabric purchased in Hamburg. The bone bodice has an extremely tapered waist with around which are 12 small rounded tabs. On the left is the silver brocade that's patterned with flowers and leaves. The sleeves are removable made of several layers of thin patterned gauze called engageante, meaning false sleeves. The rigid bodice is heavily boned and fastened at the center back with lacing through 13 handworked eyelets on either side. Here are some close-up images of Claire's wedding gown taken from Terry Dresbach's blog. The bodice is laced at the back through rings rather than grommets and lightly boned. The fullness of the skirt comes from these densely folded cartridge pleats attached to the waistband of the overgown. Here is a close-up of the white sleeve fabric and silver gown fabric. Dresbach said, we tried to avoid this silver fabric and weave our own, but once we saw it on a camera test under candlelight, we knew it was the right one. It just did the proper shimmer. Pictured are thin shavings of mica mineral from Dresbach's blog. Liz tells me, I showed Terry samples of the metal threads, spangles, hot fix rhinestones, hot fix pearls, metal foils and foiling, angelina fiber and mica powders. Then I showed her a picture of a 17th century box covered in sheet mica and brought my stash of mica in to show her. We all took turns shaving mica during stressful times, Dresbach said. It was a very zen activity. Chop wood, carry water, saved our sanity. We started with these three chunks of mica around four inches long by three inches thick. We shaved them down to a large container of paper-thin flakes. Liz tells me that the mica slivers were glued onto a cream layer below the sheer layer with the silver embroidered leaves, like we see here on the stomacher portion. Here's a picture of the smocking technique of the sleeves. Dresbach said, we had this beautiful little smocking machine that operates with a hand crank, makes beautiful, magical things. And on the right is a picture of one of the completed sleeves. Here's Dresbach's illustration of the embroidered motif for the stomacher. Of the silver embroidery, Dresbach said, we made hundreds of leaves and acorns all by hand. You can see the metal strands very clearly. It is an amazing process, extraordinary work. And then Liz tells me, we stitched the leaves and acorns on net so we could start producing the embroidery before the dress was made. It also gave us the freedom to have many people embroidering at the same time. The slips, as embroidered motifs to be applied or called, could be positioned wherever we liked and the breaking down process for the embroidery wouldn't be directly on the dress fabric. There were six people embroidering leaves and acorns over six to eight weeks, Liz says, and I embroidered the stomacher myself over about a week. Once the embroidery was done, the individual slips had to be aged with dye and breakdown, and then they had to be hand-sewn to the gown. 
One of the most challenging aspects of working on the gown, she says, was probably to work on how to make the 3D stems and ribbons for the stomacher using very fragile strips of metal. The more embossed they are, the easier they are to snap. After researching supplies and ordering supplies and going through the sampling process for the embroidery, Liz says, Terry decided on plate embroidery for leaves and acorns using a little pearl pearl, a stiff spring of metal thread cut and used like a flexible bead for the acorn cups with different textures of plate used for the stems and ribbons on the stomacher. Of this close-up of the completed stomacher from her blog, Dresback said, all the leaves, stems, and acorns have been painted to look as though they've been oxidized, giving them lovely tone and depth. This stitching or smocking on the silk reflects the stitching done on the sleeve. Just stunning work by my amazing crew. And I thought I'd show you this picture. Claire's gown waiting for her display to be ready. I always think about how horrified the costume designers must be when they see something like this, a fully dressed mannequin sitting on a dolly without so much as a drop cloth over it after hundreds of hours have gone into its creation. Liz tells me, I think what surprised me about the gown was the amount of time that went into it, far beyond the scale of any costume that I've ever worked on, and I've worked for the National Opera and Ballet Companies. So at least someone had the idea to lift the skirts up so that it wouldn't get caught in some piece of equipment. Here's an incredible cosplay of Claire's wedding gown by Lilu3121. She says, I made this dress two years ago to wear it on a German Outlander convention in Cologne called The Gathering. And with this dress, I won first prize of the costume contest there. Lilu says that for her stunning recreation, the entire project took about four months, most time for modifying the pattern and the embroidery. She tells me that the fabric was a challenge to find in a budget, and this is where she was very resourceful, saying, So the white muslin wasn't hard to find. I ordered it at an online fabric shop. The gray linen was very much harder to find, and I couldn't find a cheap silver shining linen. So I bought a gray linen curtain at Ikea and dyed it with silver color. Funny enough, she says, a few weeks ago, I found a perfect silver shining linen in a sale at an online shop. So I was so crazy and ordered 14 meters. And if I find time, I will chance it. Costume designer Terry Dresbach gave Lilu a shout out on Twitter. Here are all of Lilu's raw materials before she started her project. I always love seeing these shots like ingredients for a recipe set out before all the hard work takes place. Here are Lilu's in-progress pictures of the bodice. She tells me that the stomacher is all hand-embroidered with silver floss. For cosplay, I found this sulky silver metallic thread by Guterman, which is essentially a thin, flat, ribbon-like foil that is laminated with polyester. And if you're searching for a suitable silver gown fabric, I found this metallic linen cotton blend chambray from B&J Fabrics in New York. It's actually a very reasonably priced fabric and it's a combination of linen cotton with a small percentage of lurex, which is a type of metallic yarn. And as I've mentioned before, I'd highly recommend ordering a swatch before taking on a large project like this. And for the sleeve, stomacher, and underskirt, here's my go-to silk chiffon from Top Fabric of Soho in Oyster, although it's not, you know, exactly a pure white. The next most important aspect of Claire's wedding ensemble, of course, are her gorgeous underpinnings. It's important because her low neckline of the gown is contingent on the silhouette of her strapless stays. The stays are worn over a very sheer shift. Methinks that this one is silk and it's worn under her petticoat. This picture features the beautiful quilted band on the bottom of the petticoat. Here's a shot of Katrina Balfe during a fitting or for a continuity picture wearing just the shift and the front lacing stays. I don't have a good close-up of the stay fabric, but it looks like it's floral and leaf white work embroidery. There's also this pretty embroidery bordering the petals. The stays are laced through these metal rings like we also see on her wedding gown that are stitched on one side of the ring with very tiny stitches. For historical reference, here's an example of Ladies French Silk Brocade Stays from Augusta Auction that date from 1700 to 1720. These stays feature metal eyelets that lace the panels together. 
Here's a good close-up of Claire's wedding ring. According to Dresback, this ring is supposed to be made from a key and was changed to the ring from the book, which apparently many fans were disappointed at. I personally like this rustic style of jewelry. To me, the ring reminds me of these 11th century Viking amulet rings seen here, and they're both from Sweden. In the episode by the pricking of my thumbs, Claire wears this silk brocade gown. Drasbeck states on her blog, Anyway, this dress was one of the first costumes I got really excited about. We finally had a permanent and very talented cutter, our third in about two months. The result was very exciting. As I've mentioned before, the gloomy interiors of the castle do no favors for dresses like this. It just makes the motif on the gown look muddied. Drasbeck has also added this fur ruff and cuffs to the dress. Here's a better shot of the gown in this behind the scene image. In these mannequin shots from Dresback's blog, you can see that the woven fabric is actually a gray green background with a golden leaf motif. The thread creating the bone channels looks white, but that might just be from the flash. The bone channels and back lacing are identical to her wedding gown, as is the cartridge pleated skirt. Terry Dresbeck was excited to finally get Claire in a plaid or erisade. Brenna says that, I think most women would have worn a plaid of some sort. Plaid is not necessarily a tartan piece of fabric that can simply mean a large width of cloth or blanket. So even if they couldn't afford a tartan erisade, they would have had one of plain material. It served as a sort of coat cloak. And Dresbeck said, It went against everything that you were supposed to do on a lead actress any actress, any woman really, a giant piece of tartan wrapped around a giant plaid skirt that is worn over a padded roll designed to make your hips look wider. And then you belt it all in the middle with a man's belt? And for reference, pictured on the left is A Town Lady by James Besire from 1745, showing the erisade worn draped over the head as a shawl. And on the right is a section of an illustration from 1760, which is a little bit later, that was taken from letters from a gentleman in the north of Scotland to his friend in London, with a woman pictured in the center also wearing an arisade. When I asked Brenna if women actually wore a leather belt with the arisade, she said, just because this is the traditional way of wearing it doesn't mean women weren't creative, but they might not have had a leather belt. As I said previously, leather was expensive and belts were not typically a part of a woman's attire at this point. At least not the sort Claire is wearing or how she is wearing it. It's a very modern way of doing it and one which lends itself well to the current blanket scarf trend, something television and film designers need to be savvy about. And as a special treat, I'm very excited to share this with you. Kristen Jones has agreed to show you how to wear an Arisade Outlander style. So take it away, Kristen. Hey everyone, I'm going to show you how to wear a Scottish erisade, which is basically like an 18th century women's jacket or a cloak. Very simple garment. It's just a piece of plaid, which Heidi has already explained to you. A plaid is not necessarily a tartan pattern fabric, it's just a certain weave of fabric, woolen fabric. Could be tartan and very awesome, or very often was, but not necessarily. It's a length of about three and a half yards of plaid fabric, usually full width. I have narrowed mine because modern sensibilities tell me I want it to be less bulky. So I, I narrowed this to about 48 inches wide and I've just folded it in half lengthwise. So to wear an aid, you wrap it over your side and put the end about at your knee, just like this, and then take a leather belt. You'll want a good long one. I made this one myself, but any old belt technically will do. You wrap it around your waist, put it at your natural waist, and this is why I like the extra long belt because then you can add this detail, which looks super cute. So adjust so that it lays at an angle across your bust that's pleasing. Straighten it out on the side. And that's it for the first half. You could wear it just like this, except it would drag the ground. It's quite long still. And it wouldn't keep this half of your body warm. So take the other half, wrap it around you like a scarf or a shawl. 
Just wrap it around you like this. And then you're going to take this end and flip it over your shoulder like that. Now we're not done. You may think we are, but we're not. Take this and tuck it into the belt in the back to hold the back secure. Straighten it out so that it lays flat. If I had a lady's maid, she could straighten it for me, but I haven't, so myself. Now, I've got this big weird thing sticking out here. Just reach up, grab it, and pull it down under like that. A little bit of straightening to do. And you've got a super warm woolen towel that you can wear. Keeps your entire upper body warm. And looks super awesome too. That's it. I really love Claire's episode 14 juggler costume that includes a man's embroidered coat and hand painted waistcoat, linen shirt trues, and a tricorn hat. Dressback said, There is nothing greater than a woman wearing men's clothing. Kate so embraced and reveled in the freedom given to Claire and to herself after both of them being trapped for months in heavy woolen women's clothing. Here's a great behind the scenes shot of Katrina Belf and her body double. Notice that the costumes are identical in every way down to the missing button on the coat. Here's a studio shot of the costume. Dressback said, this was also the first time the amazing talented textile artist, Helen Galogli, painted for us after joining our team. She does beautiful work and is creating truly startling textiles for us in season two. This image features a detail from the coat Dresback said, and the equally talented Emily Watson created that felted embroidery on the coat. How fantastic is that? In these two images, Dresback compares the aging process. On the left is Claire's waistcoat before aging and on the right after aging. She says, my team did a phenomenal job of aging this piece. We shredded it and then darned it. You can see some of the darns in this picture. For Claire's season one finale costume, Dresback describes on her blog how her team were already knee deep in season two costumes and had lost their cutters and were just rotating through cutters when they had to make a decision about this dress. Dresback said, I remembered that we still had one of the very first costumes we had made for Claire somewhere in the racks. I think it was the second costume we'd made for her and for some reason we decided not to use it and never finished it. We dug it up and found our solution, she said. We could finish it without having to design and cut an entirely new gown. And it was actually quite perfect for the traveling costume procured for Claire by the monks. A pretty gown, but nothing spectacular. It was completely believable that it would have belonged to someone else. Dresback said, one of the things I love best about this gown was the lovely embroidered stomacher we had made. It came from a piece of embroidered fabric we picked up shopping at the Portobello Market in London. It was also one of the first examples I had seen of metal plate embroidery, which I had completely fallen in love with and we ultimately used on Claire's wedding dress. And interestingly, you can see some stains on the linen embroidered fabric. Dresback said we didn't even have an embroidery team at that point in the very beginning of season one, but Liz Bolton had let me in on her skill as a historical embroiderer. I asked if she could embroider a petticoat to match the piece of antique fabric and we ended up with a very sweet gown. It was perfect for embarking on a new life in France. And you might notice that in this picture the embroidered fabric is upside down with the flowers hanging downward. Here's a picture of the completed costume without the cloak. And in this shot from season two, you can see the embroidery on the skirt that Liz Bolton matched up to the bodice. And I also love this pretty blue-green hooded cloak, a similar shorter version of her tartan lined cape. That ends part three on the costumes of Outlander. Thank you to everyone who participated in helping make this video possible, but especially to Brenna Barks, who has helped toward making five Outlander videos in total. And if you haven't had a chance to check out my other Outlander videos, I'll leave a link in the description. And as always, thank you so much for watching.